I'm too busy really just means I'm really struggling to, to manage my time. I'm talking about mastering time. And if you want to master time, you have to master the value of your time so that you can make wiser decisions. You bought a jet? I bought a jet. Who does that? You know, I think rich people do. Yes, rich people do. <laughs> yeah, it was interesting. I made a little Instagram post and I'm, I'm like, I don't know what it is about a jet. I'm, I was expecting, you know, a lot of comments, but not maybe a lot of friendlies. I think for the most part, everyone was like, really like, dude, that is so amazing. That's cool. There's this one person who's like, oh yeah, yeah. Like, why don't you get real, bro? Like, just tell the truth. You just got net jets and, and like, you're now some kind of what's, member. What's net jets? Oh, dude, that's just where you pay like a, like a monthly fee. And then you have access to, f I'm like, no, I actually bought a jet cash that I own 100% and it's not part of some weird system. Uh, but you know, you know, uh, I decided a couple years ago that I wanted to own a jet for one reason to look cool. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, well, it, no Chris, it, honestly, it, when I look at you, no, I'm like, it's, it's no. marketing. You're our product. No, like, it's, I, it's, it's all about time. Yeah, totally. And, um, so I made a commitment the last year when I decided to write this book, this new book coming out, uh, probably in 18 months from now, the book is an experiment. What would happen if every decision that you made in your life was a correct response to the value of your time? My yeah. buddies called me up and they said, Chris, go pick up some pizza on the way to my place to play some video games. So I called up my assistant. I said, please have pizza delivered. It took me 30 seconds to shoot out the text. And by the time I got there, I didn't have the pizza in the hand. My buddies were like, dude, where's the pizza? I said, oh, my assistant's getting it. And they're like, and they started laughing at me. They're like, ha, ha. like you could have driven to Little Caesars and just picked up, you know, your $5 ready pizzas and brought four or five pizzas. Why didn't you do that? And I said, cause that would have taken me like eight minutes. And they laughed again. They're like, eight minutes? Like, what's wrong with you? And I'm like, well, I apologize, but in my world, I count seconds. So eight minutes is a significant amount of time. It turns out a jet will save me. It will, I will give my family 15 more days a year of me. Dude, that's an easy decision. As long as it financially so makes sense. You're saying that when you're twiddling your thumbs in the airport, just waiting at the gate. Dude, it's more than that. When the you're going through security, no, 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 when you've got a layover, that that first all adds all, up. who sets the schedule for flights? They like, do. Like, yep, first 100%. of all, I, I like, we're at a Delta hub in Salt Lake, so I like flying Delta. And if you have to fly American or anything else, it's kind of a crappy experience, right? Like, first class isn't that spacious as Delta's first class, and, and there's, the leg room isn't quite, you know, what it is. And they don't have, like, the little monitors with, like, the little TV thing. So you just have fewer options in what you can do yep. there. And so, yes, I have a preference on which airline I like to fly with, but it means that I'm also susceptible to their schedule. So all of a sudden, they're determining my calendar. They're determining where and when I can fly. They're also determining, you know, because for me, years ago, I said, it's got to be first class. And no, I'm not going to do, um, like, I'm not doing pit stops. We're not going to. Yeah. You know, we're, we're not going to stop part way through the flight because you start adding it up. And on any trip that you go anywhere around, you've got to get to the airport 90 minutes early or two hours early. You've got to go through TSA. You've got to be prodded. You have to wait. Then when it's time to board the plane, that's like a freaking 40 minute process. Sometimes you have to sit on the tarmac. Um, when you get off the plane, there's lines like, so Seriously? there's this whole system. And I calculated an average savings of nine hours per round trip if I'm flying domestic. So if you know nine hours, that's a day. Totally. I, nine uh, hours is a day. On, our, on my last trip, we went to Atlanta for Thanksgiving and my daughter was asking me on the plane, you know, they have the little map yeah. and she's like, where are we going? I'm like here. And she's like, but why are we going to New York first? <laughs> right. <laughs> like, well, that, and I was like, well, that's where the next plane will be. That'll take us to Atlanta. They didn't have something going directly to Atlanta. Well, and, and, then, and then my wife and I, we never check bags because I don't know why. They always lose them. I don't know why. They just, they're going to lose it. So even when we pack internationally, if we have to check something. Chris, you're saying you don't know why? You look out the window while you're waiting for your flight and you just watch them loading the baggage onto the plane. And sometimes you throwing. know why they lose yeah. them. I've seen these guys just like. Just chucking luggage up onto that thing, the conveyor belt. And yeah. it's not like they're being gentle with so, everything. So listen, um, flying is already a great privilege. Like I'm super, super grateful for it. Online, there's going to be some people that are like, but Chris Crone, come on, why is first class a big deal, bro? For me, it's like about one thing. It's not about status. It's about the fact that I'm six foot three and a half. Yeah. I'm just saying it. Online, they're like, you're five well, seven, right? I'm like, I'm not five seven. Everyone's always shocked when they meet me. They're like, whoa. 
you're, you're so big. I'm like, no, actually, like, I can't, I've tried. I cannot fall asleep coach. I can't. My, like, literally the amount of space. First of all, my knees are hitting the seat in front of me. <laughs> the, and if the, the person, person leans sitting back, in front of you, oh, man. And that person leans back, like, I, like, I've heard my knees, like, make snapping sounds. And so, but trying to literally, and the reality is, I mean, my body type, I mean, I'm, I'm pretty top heavy. So trying to lean forward with enough, like I've, I've used those weird triangle pills. Dude, I've tried everything. I've tried drugs. Like my mom uses these hardcore sleeper pills. I, uh, we couldn't get first class and I had my kids with me and they were young enough. We were doing this mission trip in Kenya. So I'm like, okay, I get it. So we're gonna, you know, we're gonna have to fly coach. I don't want to, it's literally one of the only options. So we're, we're doing it. And my mom gave me like a Zambian or something like the Ambien. I don't even know what they're called. It's like hardcore. And so I think I'm timing it right and I take it. But because of the angle, I can't fall asleep. And I zombied through the night, hallucinating all sorts of murder scenes. What? And like I had the wildest, weirdest trip of my life. I'll never want to repeat it ever again. I swore off I'm never going to use, you know, anything, anything more hardcore than, um, than melatonin to try to <laughs> fall asleep. So, you know, if it's not first class and if it's not direct, I'm not flying. Yeah. Which really, if you start thinking about it at that point, it's like, you know, I fly a lot. I fly enough. And, um, you know, a couple years ago, I started flying private. And I started realizing, geez, when you fly private, there's some advantages that you pick up. Number one, you can get to the airport like three minutes before you want to take off. Like yeah. you literally just get on the plane and then they go. You, you can also get to the airport late yeah I, like and, I get to, and, and the plane waits I can, for you i can kind of get the airport whenever i feel like it yeah the other thing that happens though is you start accessing regional airports and a lot of people don't understand there's four thousand regional airports everyone's flying into the same major you know 100 destinations but there's four thousand. so like uh there's this tiny little mountain town in leavenworth uh, called leavenworth in washington and um if you fly into seattle dude it takes like three hours to drive yeah. to leavenworth there is at Wenatchee, little airport, 20 minutes outside of Leavenworth, little airport strip. And there's this cabin that we're looking at in Montana and nine and a half miles away, it's got a little landing strip, right? And so I'm like, all of a sudden you start adding up the time savings of, okay, so I don't have to wait at an airport. I don't have to go through TSA. I don't have to follow. I don't, I don't have to some, have someone risk putting me on a no fly or whatever because of the I'm not wearing my mask the way that they like. There's no masks. Oh yeah, I don't that's wow. Uh, and then I, I get to fly more direct to where I'm going, and more importantly, when I'm done with whatever I'm doing, if I'm early, call the pilot. We're going to leave three hours early. Boom, we're out. So it, it's just this whole book is about mastering time. And a lot of people don't understand how to positively arbitrage your time. Most people live up with a really dumb rule. If you want something done right, you should do it yourself. I'm like, that's probably the dumbest advice that I was ever given. Sorry, Dad. And I challenged it. And when I did, I started realizing that I am meant to do very few things. I'm meant to do what I love. I'm meant to do what I'm good at. I'm meant to do what I enjoy. And I'm meant to do the things where I have the highest value proposition. Which means that there was a time in my early career when my time was worth $100 an hour, I stopped doing $15 an hour stuff. Then my time was worth $1,000 an hour, I stopped doing $200 stuff. Then there was a time when my time was worth $5,000, $10,000 an hour. If your time is worth $10,000 an hour, how does it feel picking up your dry cleaning? My son at the dinner table said something really, really weird yesterday. We turned it into a family teaching moment. He said, Dad, and he's, he's 10 years old, he says, rich people, they're so lazy. Like they hire people to clean for them. The words literally came out of his mouth. Now he, he wasn't thinking, and it's not like my children know, like, okay, my, my, my kids, they're, they're smart. So they understand that we're very, very well to do. We, we try not to flaunt or get kind of crazy like that. But I had to sit down and say, hey son, first of all, let me ask you, do you think Emma and Kristen, do you think they like their job? Do you think they're grateful for it? Do you think they appreciate it? It's like, yeah, and you know how much I appreciate them? Because they do things that I don't always get to, or I, or I have to make choices. This all comes, this whole book is about this phrase that we abuse as humans. I'm busy. Mm -hmm. This is the, like two of the worst words that you could say for 2022. I'm busy. All you're really saying is I've made commitments that I can't keep. I don't have integrity. I don't do what I say I'm going to do. Isn't that what it means when we say I'm too busy? Aren't we really saying I'm defaulting on obligations because I've overcommitted myself, which is an act of unconsciousness? So I'm too busy really just means I'm really struggling to, to manage my time. I'm talking about mastering time.
And if you want to master time, you have to master the value of your time so that you can make wiser decisions. So for you, this jet is, is a function of time, yeah. of time management. Yeah. And, uh, and, I, and I want to be clear, I like flying private too. Course, I'm not, I'm not going to lie. Like, there's a lot of really cool perks. I'm flying right. to Tucson with my wife and a bunch of our friends. And like, within like three minutes, all the seats were like packed because my wife had given them away to all of her friends. I'm like, uh, don't I get a say on this thing? And it's nope. just one of those things in marriage where apparently not. not, not so for that's a pretty, pretty big price tag though. To well, put that on depends. Just saving it, your time. Like, okay, so can I push back? What, what is a lot of money? This is another unconscious thing that we talk about. Oh, so much money. I, I was talking to one of my buddies who makes over a million dollars a year. And he said, oh, I hate buying that one type of crypto. The fees are so expensive. He said, they're like, they're like $30. And I sat there for just a moment. I'm like, I can't believe that I just... Did I just hear you correctly? And to him, I mean, dude, Josh is a buddy of mine. And, and I don't know, I think what he really meant was, it compared doesn't matter what he others. meant, but what he meant was compared to other crypto plays, these fees are higher, but there's energy behind the unconscious things that we say that lead to programming that isn't always intentional. And um, so this idea of, well, isn't a jet a lot of money? It's, it's all relative. And it's all relative to the value of your time. So the question is, do you understand the value of your time? Here's an activity that I give every entrepreneur. I'm, um, anytime I meet an entrepreneur that says I'm too busy, I have too much opportunity and I'm struggling to do it all. I sit there and I think, okay, so clearly one of your goals is, is to be successful, but not necessarily to be happy because anyone that can't manage their time really often struggles to be happy because they're the ones that say, I don't have balance in my life or I've put too much effort here, not in my marriage. I put too much effort in my marriage, but not in my kids. I put too much effort in my kids, but not my business. I put too much effort in my business, but not my health. I'm like, okay, so we have a balance problem. And, um, you know, I was interested. Yeah. It was kind of interesting to me that when I was in Tony Robbins organization for a while, you know, one of his highest levels, he, he loves to say that balance is a, how does he word it? He basically says that like balance is a, is a lie. It doesn't exist. And I'm sure he must mean something by that. I just don't agree. I actually believe that there is enough time for every conscious, responsible choice that we make. There's time for, for it all. And there's time to literally have nothing left to do. And I make sure that my life always has spare time because I'm in charge of when I say yes and no. And if, you, if you're busy, you've said too, yes too many times. And if you don't like how much money you're making, you've said yes to the wrong things. So... Mm -hmm then you have to alter your standard of when you say yes and when you say no, which comes down to understanding the value of your time. So I tell these entrepreneurs, I'm like, make, make a list of 10 things you do with your time. So they'll make a list of their top 10 activities. Then I'll say, great, now make a list of the value. What would you have to pay someone to do each of those 10 activities? And inevitably, those valuable things are things that only they can do. Oh my gosh, it's 10,000 an hour when I do this. It's 1,000 an hour when I do this. What about that? Oh, that's 150 bucks. Do you have someone that could do that? Yeah, I, I do. I could I give it to them, but I'm doing it. And once they're done with the exercise, I say, great, there's going to be a natural cutoff point where more than half of the things are way less valuable than the few things that you did that are insanely valuable. And when I tell people to make that list, you know what I tell them to do? Check off the things that... Make a commitment right now that you will never do any of those lower value things ever again. You'll probably recapture 70 to 80% of your time. Yeah. And what happens is they become fearful. Like, oh my gosh, what am I going to do with my time? I said, well, now you need to set higher standards. You see, if your highest value of your time is 10,000 an hour, then here's my rule of thumb. Double that and tell the universe no to any opportunity until it can produce an opportunity that pays you 20,000 an hour. And unless it pays $20,000 an hour, your time can't be bought and you're just going to enjoy having more time. Go play a video game with your kid. Go travel somewhere. Go do something fun. I'd rather have my time than keep saying yes to more of the same sized opportunities, which creates a perpetual problem of busyness. That's not a life to live. That's, that's relatively unpresent and unconscious. So that's why a jet. So back to the jet question, Chris, we've only been on, talking about the jet. <laughs> we've been talking about time. Um, the jet, do you put it on, on your balance sheet? As an are you, asset? Are you putting the jet as an asset or a liability? Of course it's an asset. So, so? Uh, listen, uh, there's definitely, I would say one in every five remarks on social media is like, taxes, brother paid too much in taxes, and they're not wrong. 
they're not wrong. Okay, so hold on. What, what does that mean? What does that mean? Well, what it means is is that there's there's a couple of cool loopholes in the tax code that you're meant to leverage if they make sense. Um, like for example, uh, earlier this year, I had a custom built um, apocalypse Jeep put together. Yeah. We've all seen it. The six it was wheeler. A, it was a, it was a quarter million dollar supercharged six wheeler, like ultimate vehicle. Like, like I got to tell you this, we, we got like 18 inches of snow and 10 minutes away. We had to go pick up my dog and my wife's like, Chris, the dog man, he can't take the dog anymore. We got to go. Yeah. I was like, I'm not going out there. She's like, come on, we have an apocalypse. <laughs> So we get in the apocalypse and no one's driving anywhere, but everyone's snow blowing. And I tell you that everyone stopped their snow blowing and shoveling just stared. to just look, because you know, on the one hand, they're thinking no one should be on the road. And then unless you have a vehicle like that, then you can. And it brought a lot of smiles to people. And no, we, awesome. we didn't have a problem getting to the dog and picking the dog up. Um, but under section 179 of the tax code, I was able to write off 100% of that business vehicle. It's 6,000 pounds in weight, meets the minimum, it's over 7,000 technically, and the bed has to be longer than six feet by at least an inch, which we had it extended to seven feet. So this custom this custom monster, you know, assuming the worst tax bracket between federal and state, 42%, um, you know, basically means, and you know, after my marginal tax rate got reduced, the government basically paid for a third, 40% of it. It was kind of cool. Uh, a jet is kind of like the exact same thing, just bigger. Yeah. So one person commented 179. I'm like, correct. <laughs> Section 179 uh, says that you're that that you you can if you follow all the rules of of owning a jet and writing it off and using it for business, etc. You can write off 100% of it in the first year. And for my tax situation, it basically meant I'm going to give two dollars to Uncle Sam, but if I buy this jet, I'll put one dollar into the jet. I can give $2 to Uncle Sam, or I can put $1 into a jet that I can also run like an asset, charter when I'm not using it, yeah. and make it profitable, which you can't do with most jets, but this one you can. Hmm. So in the end, it, it, like it, most people look at it and they're like, nice flex. And I'm like, well, actually it's designed to make it's me money, tax store an yeah. asset, and save me money that I'm not giving the government because I don't have to. Why would the government have these loopholes? Um, because the government is stimulating the economy. They're, because they're aware of them. This isn't owners. like I mean, the IRS 50%, is like, half of all GDP comes from the small Chris, business Chris, you owner. figured it out. No, no, they don't have problems like that at all. But things have to be properly documented. Like I have, uh -huh. a t I have staff of people that do nothing, but literally create documentation for everything. Because a lot of people don't understand so much of the tax code is, is, due, is like, it's open for interpretation. Mm -hmm. When I travel somewhere, last, I, I took my wife last month to the Maldives, uh, 20th anniversary. And while we're out there, I'm like, well, honey, you hold the camera and let's make five YouTube videos. And we were out there for a week and we made five YouTube videos. And I made marketing like 10 of these, uh, you know, 40 second marketing videos. And you know, each one of those videos makes me about 10 grand. You know, so overall, we probably brought in six figures from having spent in a beautiful location, I don't know, probably, probably three hours out mm -hmm. of our week making videos. And like if, if the IRS audits me, and I assume they will, I've done it a couple of times in the past. I have a team that's like, Here's links to the marketing videos. Here's a link to the ROI. Here's the money that we made. This is why they went on this trip, you know? And then we're smart, right? We don't write everything off. We just write off the applicable things, mm -hmm. um, you know, because the, the trip, you know, the, the IRS is, really wants to keep people from tax evasion or from taking advantage of the tax code. And there is a spirit of the law that is almost more important than a letter of the law, um, which is, are you really just trying to keep from giving the government, you know, its taxes, you know, or, you know, are you, have you found an, a balanced approach where you can be aggressive to the letter of law that's available, but not take advantage of the spirit of law? So I have a tax team of people that that's what they do. So I don't want to cross the line. Uh, I assume I'm going to be audited. And, you know, the last time I was audited, I ended up owing nothing yeah. to the government. And that's because we documented it. Documented. Well. Um, so this jet, how many, how many people, how many entities does it impact by being in function and you investing in it? I have a corporation that owns it and it, it seats eight. And then, um, I found a, I found a company first that I really liked that, um, have mastered the game of chartering jets is kind of interesting because you can get a mid-sized jet like mine is for eight, or you can get a super heavy jet. That's three times more money that also seats eight that super heavy. You can stand up fully in, um, but it doesn't charter as well as a, a, a more entry level mid sized jet. So mm -hmm. this jet for me was probably more of a business decision than even a personal decision. Yeah. Like I, I would want a different jet for myself and I, I don't want to sound like a jet snob. I will enjoy 
sure. riding in this jet. But I mean, this really is not the, this isn't like the splurge, like, um, you know, I bought myself a Ferrari, right? Like I didn't, I, what I did is I got a really, really great, smart, economic jet that is designed to make you money. You bought a Toyota of a jet instead of a Lamborghini. Sure. We could say that. Toyota makes a great Uber. Yeah. And so it's more of a business. It's, um, and, and, and that's also me. I mean, this has shown up my entire life in business is that I, I'm always financially practical before I ever get, before I go after luxury. Mm -hmm. And I'm at a point where there's certain areas of my life where... You can be luxurious. Yeah. I, lo I, love, I love the luxury play. But, you know, for Jet, I went smart for this first round. Yep. And um, this, I made room this next year that I could buy another one. Okay. So what are the cons of owning a Jet? Is um, there any downside? Yeah, there's a ton of downside. Like right now, jets, first of all, don't really have a history of performing really well as just an Uber. Um, and what's become really popular in the last two years, there's this weird thing happening in the world. It's this, there's, this, there's this cough that's going around. And because of that, the media has blown it insanely out of proportion. That's weird. And so as a result, it's really impacted like policy and freedom on the planet. And so guess what wealthy people are doing everywhere? They are chartering and they are, they are charting private jets and they're buying private jets. Right now, there's fewer than like- So you're saying due to the pandemic, there's demand for this? Massively. Everyone oh, wants, like gosh. wealthy people are flying private. They do not want to fly commercial. Dude, I've been harassed. Oh, so my last, makes dude, on my last sense. first class flight, I literally, the, the, the stewardess or what are they supposed to be called? I don't want to use the wrong word. Whatever. The flight the, attendant. The flight attendant came by right when I was adjusting my mask because I had just eaten something. And then it literally happened the second time she came by and she, she started off so nice. She like knelt down right next to me and in a very threatening voice said, sir, listen, you've been a great customer, but I see what you're doing there with the mask. And I want you to know, I would hate to put you on a no fly zone, no fly list. It'll impact every airline. You'll never, ever get to fly anywhere ever again. Like if I don't see you putting that mask, like she started getting a little hostile and she did the same thing to my wife. Who's like the one, like one of the sweetest human beings on the planet. And after that experience, we're like, oh my gosh, like I felt harassed. I was, I, I wore my mask the entire time. Um, like I, I happened to have one that didn't fit very well. So I had to keep adjusting a little bit to kind of keep it over my nose and mouth. And uh, even as much as I hate so much of what that is and what it represents, like I'm, I'm playing by the rules, right? Mm -hmm. I'm a rebel entrepreneur, but nonetheless, I'm following the rules. But I, my wife and I were both harassed. Uh, and, and for me, it was just, I think that there's a lot of that happening in the world and the wealthy if you, they have the money, they're saying, why would I put myself through that? Why, I don't even want to participate. I'm, first of all, I'm not watching the news. Second of all, I'm done with the chaos. And if you want to know the one place in the world where the pandemic is affecting everything, it's called an airport. Like airport, yeah. it's, it's quite horrendous. Um, I flew United Emirates, which is one of the nicest airlines on the, you know, when we flew first class over to the Maldives. And it was so cool because in your own, you have your own kind of bed, you have your own room. They didn't care whether you wore masks the entire time. And I'm like, oh my gosh, hmm. this is one of the strictest nations on the planet. And these people, they don't care. <laughs> that was just kind of a strange, that's not been my experience in, in, in airports overall. Right. So is that the biggest con is? Yeah. The, so what I mean by that is that if you fast forward one, two, three, four years, um, there may not be the as demand, demand for private jets might go down. And if the demand goes down, that will mean that if there's people that were buying jets that were counting on revenue from chartering, if that chartering demand goes down, they might be left holding a multi-million dollar asset that is now bleeding them because there's definitely an expense to it. And so, um, you also have to be in this, you have to be in a safe position. Like best case scenario works really well for me. Worst case scenario. I don't care. Worst case scenario. If I, if it charters way less than even half the time, then when I'm not even using it, I'm like, I'm still in a financial situation where it will have been a really smart move. And more importantly, I'll have been able to value my time, which is just really important for this book because I'm putting my whole heart and soul into this notion of how I spend my time. So that when the book is ready and when the book comes out, I will have been the entire living embodiment at the most authentic level of what the message of that book really is, which is never, ever sell yourself for less than your value. Don't prostitute yourself. Don't waste your time. Value it and use it appropriately.